Good afternoon, everyone. Um, Nasreen Rahimye. I'm a Howard Baskerville Professor of Humanities at UCI and a Professor of Comparative Literature at UCI. And I want to thank the uh, Jordan Center for sponsoring this conversation and helping us set it up. I would like to uh, briefly introduce the mention the name of our participants and tell you what the process will be like and when we will open up for your questions. So I'm just delighted to have these three marvelous academics, these women, um, Claudia Yaroubi, who's a professor of Persian and comparative literature, she'll tell you more about it. Anahita Mahdavi, um, who will also tell us about this rich um, history that she has had. She will tell you how she's gotten here. And Nushan Shekharabi, who's um, a, a professor of political science. You'll hear much more about their experiences. What we thought we would do is to, in order to have a dynamic conversation, and be able to um, address different kinds of topics that we among ourselves consider to be important to bring up, but also to give you the participants adequate time or ample time, I should say, to ask questions as, um, as many as we can possibly answer. What I've asked um, each of our participants to do is to introduce themselves um, because they, as I mentioned, they have such a rich personal history, intellectual trajectory that needs to come out for the conversation to be more fully appreciated. Um, as you can imagine, this is a topic that's dear to all of our hearts. We are women of Iranian heritage and we are academics. We represent different generations uh, I can say safely, I am the oldest, <laughs> the most senior among you, and I, it is uh, genuinely a pleasure to be on a panel that has a multi-generational representation of Iranian women in academia. Um, when I was a graduate student, when I was studying in Canada, um, it seemed that there weren't that many role models. There were people I admired from afar. And of course, we didn't have all the social media and these wonderful technological advances that have made it possible for us to connect. But it was a, always a dream to come across these women who had forged paths ahead of, for us. For instance, I remember all the years that I was dying to meet Professor Elise Sanasarian, such a, a remarkable scholar and groundbreaking work on women's movements in Iran. And I'm so glad to say that now I can speak to her directly and I've connected with her. Same with people like Afzan and Ajmal Wadi. I mean, of course, these are field specific too, or Farzan and Milani. And when we get together, we always talk about uh, us, the older women, talk about how wonderful it is to see the changes in academia, that we have many more women in all the fields and more specifically for the Iranian Americans for this context to, um, to have many more women in all the different fields represented um, in the academy. So let me begin. I, uh, I should have done my alphabetical ordering before, but I think we'll go alph alphabetically with um, Anahita Mahdavi. May I ask you to introduce yourself and say uh, something about how you ended up in this field and anything you'd like to bring to our attention? Yes, of course. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you, UCI Center, for uh, continuing uh, these uh, wonderful events that are uh, informative for our community. We need it and uh, we are appreciative towards you. And uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Rahimi and Nasrinjan, for your leadership. Your seniority is intertwined with your leadership and being a role model for us. Um, I'm honored to be amongst all of you. Um, so I don't know where to begin this story. Is, uh, 
pretty detailed, but I try to summarize it. Um, I actually, um, if going back along to where I came uh, uh, when I left Iran, I left in 1985. I am uh, amongst that group of Iranians that got stuck in Turkey for a couple of years. So I, from the beginning of my immigration journey, I was, I became a United Nations refugee. And then forwards after that, I uh, went to Sweden because my parents and my uh, older sister were uh, living there. So, and I was there for another couple of years. And by 1990, I came to United States. My immigration journey was pr pretty complex. I did enter here with uh, visa, but uh, went out of the status. And, uh, you know, as many of us are familiar with the story of uh, going through becoming, uh, to getting a status, it took me 15 years to get a part. And so I uh, am uh, considered to be an adult student. Uh, I went back to school in America in, uh, when I was older. I'm not going to say how old, but I was older. And uh, basically uh, just in a, few, in a matter of few years, got my bachelor's, master's and uh, um, doctorate. My uh, field uh, is psychology and um, my master's is in clinical psychology. My PhD is in international psychology, more towards in the field of social psychology. Um, how did I become a, um, involved with academia, academia is, uh, or academy is uh, when I was doing my master's degree program, obviously I felt that I have a passion for teaching and I was uh, helping or what they call it TA or GA. Um, but also for my internship, when you get a master's clinical uh, degree in psychology, you need to do some form of internship. I ended up doing my internship with uh, the um, popul juvenile population, adolescents and teenagers that were not able to be mainstream. And so they were, they were in special schooling and I was the clinician working with them. Um, and it was my uh, first uh, encounter with the prison population. But I have started examining American society long before uh, when I entered to, uh, in America. I also had the blessing of growing up with a father and a mother that always taught us to examine the society that we live in. And to, as we educate ourselves, uh, make sure that we know the system that we live in and to be aware of the other suffering and never separate work, uh, social justice and and fight for a justice for all, uh, separate from whatever or, or uh, practices we have. So this uh, put me in this category of working a, with the prison population. And obviously we know the atrocities in America with incarceration rates. Um, a year after that, I was transferred to adult courts. So I was working with uh, adult population and shortly after that ended, uh, I was working in a multicultural center as a clinician slash case manager, social worker with a vast majority of refugees. So I, being a clinician was not separated from teaching either. We run a lot of psychoeducational classes. I was running a lot of community classes and um, by 2012, uh, I um, applied as a part for a part-time position in Saddleback College, and the chair of the Saddleback College that uh, has become a one of my heroes and role model and mentors, uh, Kim Branch Stewart, um, a uh, an African American woman, um, took me under her wings and trained me a lot. Um, and I have always said that I owe a lot of my uh, professional aspects in, uh, as, a, as a professor to her. Until this day, I look up to her. And uh, so that was the journey of being a part-time professor to becoming a full-time professor in 2015. 
I was hired in Long Beach City College, and by 2019, I received my tenureship. In the uh, past five years in Long Beach City College, I um, have established a, a, a student association and a um, official institutionalized program for the formerly incarcerated students. Um, and um, we were blessed to have our, the support of administration. And it's been an amazing and a journey. It's a blessing to be able to be at service. For me, teaching is not separate from uh, being for my fellow human, human beings and uh, being there when, uh, if I can do anything uh, in regards to people's struggles, whether as a teacher, as a clinician, or as a human being. However, maybe we can talk about it later when we talk about our experiences as a, a woman of color. It was not a very easy process to become tenure in my experience. It was pretty challenging because uh, sometimes, not sometimes, most of the time, when you do muster courage and you speak against the establishment, you're not always liked. Uh, but um, you know, this is, we do what we do, but I was also blessed to have a lot of support at the same time that I had a lot of uh, oppositions. But, um, so here I am. I think I stop here. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, and it, it, indeed, some of the things that you touched on, I hope to be able to pick up on later and perhaps even in the questions that'll come up. Um, a wonderful um, canvas that you painted for us there of your experiences. I was particularly struck uh, uh, on Isa Jun. I'm being informal here. This is an informal conversation, so I'm not going to yes. address you with your yes. titles, but <laughs> forgive yes. me for that. Uh, but that you were a refugee and you served the refugees later. So this is this is quite poignant from my perspective. I think that. And there's no better expression of bringing your own experiences, your own trials to bear on how we can help others and self serve others. And the question of tenure, I definitely want to come back to as well. <laughs> okay, may I alphabetically now go to Nushan Sheikh Arabi? Would you please, Nushan, introduce yourself? Hi, I'm so happy to be here. I wanted to um, thank you, Nasreen Jun and Anahita Jun and Claudia Jun uh, for being such an amazing set of role models for me. And I wanted to especially thank um, Saeed Jun and Dr. Tiraj Dariai and the UCI Center for Persian Studies um, for making this possible. And um, a special thank you to my family, my friends, and my colleagues who I know are watching. Um, I um, have been in the United States since 1984. Uh, my family and I immigrated from Iran. Um, there was a brief period of time that we were in Amman and then we came to the United States and we've sort of stayed ever since and kind of planted ourselves in California. Um, I have done um, all of my undergraduate and graduate work at Cal State University Fullerton. Um, my degree is in political science with an emphasis in international relations and peace studies and diplomacy. And uh, I was very lucky that as I was uh, finishing up my graduate work, um, through wonderful professors that I had at uh, Cal State Fullerton, Dr. Barbara Stone, Dr. Jill Fiana, um, Gianos. Um, I con they connected with uh, Santana College, which is the sister campus to Santiago Canyon College. And uh, while I was TAing or GAing as they called them, graduate assistant, teacher's assistant, they said, um, you know, they're looking for um, some adjunct professors. And I said, well, I'm not even done yet with my degree, uh, but I got incredibly lucky. And uh, they said, well, as soon as you're done with your degree, um, come on over. So I started teaching <laughs> 21 years ago now at uh, Santa Ana College. And uh, my first experience was a very large classroom with probably over 100 students and me, a very young woman at that time in a mode of panic. Uh, but I, um, I felt pretty at home. I had a brief period of time before I decided to do graduate work in political science that I also went to law school. And I did that for about a year. And then I realized that's really not my cup of tea. No offense to all my attorney friends who are amazing. Um, and we need them a lot these days, but um, it just wasn't quite my fit. So I'm very happy that I decided to teach. And uh, that part-time position at Santa Ana College turned into some part-time classes at our sister campus, uh, Santiago Canyon College six years of doing that and then a full-time position opened up and I applied and luckily 
I was selected. Um, the years of adjunct, um, you definitely pay your dues. I'm sure everybody here can relate. Um, you teach all kinds of random times and all kinds of classes and all kinds of environments and deal with all kinds of personalities. But uh, Santiago Canyon became my home. Um, 2005, I was hired as full-time. 2009, I received tenure, which as Ana Hitajun mentioned, is an interesting process, especially when you are a woman of color and um, sometimes you just walk into a room, you might be the epitome of everything the other side is uncomfortable with. <laughs> uh, but nevertheless, um, I, I've been there since. And, um, I've done some work with the Model United Nations team at our campus. I used to co-advise that with one of my colleagues, uh, Professor Ribi. Uh, now we have Professor Kramer who has taken over and he's a wonderful. Um, uh, we've been able to hire some new political scientists. Um, again, my colleagues, uh, Brenda Carpio and a number of other wonderful people in our entire division. Um, I got the chairship for the poli-sci department because uh, Dr. Perella, who is, was kind of my mentor and worked with me through the six years that I was part-time um, before retirement said, I don't wanna do this anymore. You wanna do it? And that was kind of my interview, you wanna do it? <laughs> so I said, okay. So I did it and uh, I've been doing it since. And when our new faculty came along, uh, before they were tenured, they chose not to take on the chairship and they've entrusted me with, uh, uh, their grace and told me to continue. So I've been chair for, you know, a thousand years, it feels like. Um, and it's an interesting position to be in, uh, to kind of get to work with the administrators and then to also um, continue to be a teacher at heart. I'm at a two-year institution, so we are very much teaching oriented. It's about um, being connected with your students and um, it, being chair gives me a, a nice balance of seeing what it's like, what it's like for admi administrators, but also what it's like to advocate for your department, for your programs, um, and um, it's been it's been really um, a very pleasurable experience for me, um, despite its challenges. Um, I also work on curriculum development. I'm on the honors committee at Santiago Canyon College. Uh, we used to have a political science club, which has disappeared due to the pandemic, but we like to bring that back up again to get some students to have some advocacy and be involved in some processes. Um, I wish that we had been on campus this semester as we had this election. It would have been very exciting, um, yeah. but uh, we have to do everything virtually. Um, so that's just a little bit about me, but Anahita brought up a lot of really good points that um, I'm sure I'll comment on later as well. <laughs> Thank you. That's right. Amazing. Also an incredible journey. And when you said a thousand years, I mean, even doing one year of uh, chairship is, is a long time because it's a very important responsibility. As you said, you are really serving an institution. You're serving your colleagues. You're advocating on behalf of students and colleagues. And it is a tough position to be in because everyone expects you to perform miracles as well. <laughs> but it says a great deal about your uh, administrative and personal abilities that you've been doing this for a decade. Wonderful. All right, we're continuing with our introductions. If I may turn now to Claudia Yapovi to say something about herself. Thank you so much, Nasser and John. Um, hi, everyone. And I would like to thank the UCI Jordan Center as well. Dr. Daria E, Saeed John, and of course, Nasser and John for putting together this event. I'm incredibly honored and humbled to be among this um, group of accomplished Iranian women today. And I'm kind of feeling emotional right now hearing the stories. Um, I came to the United States later than the two of you or the three of you. I arrived in Los Angeles in 2006, and, um, which is 14 years ago. And my story is a little bit different because I'm an Armenian born and raised in Iran. So the way that I came to the United States as a um, ethnic religious minority is different. So um, upon arriving, I had my green card, so it was easier um, than on Ahita John's 15-year, um, you know, gap. Um, immediately, I, when I arrived, um, I was a tenured professor in Iran at the time when I left. So uh, when I arrived, I was um, essentially made to start from the beginning. 
because they didn't accept my credentials here. Um, in terms of career, um, job, um, I had to work at the CVS pharmacy as a merchandiser at the beginning. So from tenured professor in the English department, I come to CVS pharmacy and I'm hearing all these stories from friends and family from Iran telling me, oh, was that what you wanted going to the US? Um, kind of, you know, hum humiliating, but I had a goal. So um, the goal was to be able to teach at a university in the United States, which would be one of the best ones. And um, so I put in all my energy over the past 14 years to um, get to that goal, to achieve it. The first year that I arrived in a month, I got acceptance in the master's program at Cal State LA. Uh, I started from there. I spent two years at Cal State LA, which was um, the best thing probably that happened to me because the educational system in Iran is totally different from the educational system in the United States. And um, I, I had a lot of learning to do. So I, I quickly caught up and I tried to learn everything. And then I started up the second year, I started applying for PhD programs. But since I was new in California, I, I could not envision myself going outside of you know, California. So I applied to a few um, University of California, basically campuses. And I got acceptance in the P comparative literature PhD program at the um, UCSB Santa Barbara. Um, I started my studies at UCSB in 2008. And it took me five years. I graduated in 2013. And when I was ABD, which means I, I only had the defense of the dissertation, I um, got a job offer from Georgia College and State University, which, was, which is a liberal arts university and um, with a very heavy teaching load. It's a teaching institution for four teaching load. I spent three years at Georgia College and State University, and every year I went back on job market, applying for different jobs, and gradually um, it became better. And the third year I got an offer from um, UNC Chapel Hill, and I came to UNC Chapel Hill in 2016. I started um, teaching um, per in Persian, Lit Persian studies program, and I'm, I, I came with um, a, a grant or uh, it was kind of an endowment or you know, funding that the university received from Roshan Institute. So um, that's why my title is Roshan Associate Professor in Persian Studies. And I am also the coordinator of Persian Studies program at UNC and um, just recently, in I went up early for tenure, and in April 2020, um, amongst all the chaos and the protests and COVID and everything, I got tenured. <laughs> and I have to uh, mention that I mean we all know, and we'll talk about all the obstacles and you know successes and accomplishments on the on the way. But I had the great honor of uh, working with Nasrin John and Janet Afari at UCSB, the two role models um, in, in my entire professional career, and um, the two women who saw something in me and supported me. Thank you. Thank you. Well, what an amazing story. I remember. Uh, Claudia John that we kind of celebrated together. Was it in Vienna? We were at the conference and we marked the fact that you had initially arrived from Iran in to Vienna and that 10 years later there you were. Is it 10 years? I thought it was exactly. 10 years. 10 years later there you were a um, professor of literature at have a wonderful university. So this is, these are all great accomplishments. So as we celebrate 
um, all that you have individually achieved, we also, as you've also pointed out, have to talk about some barriers, talk about some of the um, challenges we have faced or you have faced in the course of getting your education. Well, there is also the adjustment to coming from Iran and um, learning to be part of a new cultural um, world, to be part of a new academic world. So this is all very interesting. What are, uh, some of you have already mentioned the term women of color. Um, for our audience, it might be helpful to review uh, what we mean by that designation, that we are women of color. Because particularly in the Iranian community, we're used to thinking our, of ourselves as Caucasian, right? And um, belonging to not a separate ethnic, um, well, we are part of a separate ethnic group, but racially at least designated. So what is uh, that term, what does that term mean to each of you? And how do you see that designation, how has it operated in the course of your careers? We can uh, just take turns. Um, Nushan, John, you wanna take that first? I think, uh, first of all, for me, it's been difficult to um, even convince a lot of people in our community that we are not to be identified as white. I think that the census that we had and the conversations around that, especially in the last four years um, have been uh, rather provocative, I think. But uh, to me, it, it's, it's strength. To me, it's a celebration of our cultural composition. And um, I don't necessarily think that it's always been an obstacle for me in my career. Perhaps I've been very lucky, um, but I have witnessed it in my colleagues' careers, how that has created a problem. And, and with my students, um, especially uh, before the travel bans, I had a lot of international students from Iran in my classes, most of them are gone now because they are not able to return. Uh, but uh, we had some interesting conversations about the element of what it means to be a woman of color and, and the element of being a, a minority and to understand that we are um, uh, more deeply ingrained and connected and impacted by what it's like to have a minority status in the United States than to have a status of a quote, white person. You know? um, so for me, it's been an opportunity, I think, to educate myself and to educate those around me that uh, this is not something to be looked down upon. It is something to acknowledge. It is something to celebrate. Um, but I get a lot of resistance um, in, in our community, uh, I must say, to, to be identified as such. And uh, even if I have a Facebook post uh, that's something very personal on my page, it doesn't, I, I think if I even reference myself as a woman of color, I, I oftentimes, you know, I'm told privately that, no, you're white. And then I have to get into the whole discussion of, well, that's actually not true. And, you know, then three hours has gone by. <laughs> so, uh, but, but for me, it's been, it's been really a celebration of the minority status and, and the I identifying with all of the uh, positive aspects of that. I don't, I don't look at it as a negative, despite what the culture has um, tried to get me to move towards. Right. Um, Claudia, John, you want to try yeah. in? Of course, I can, I can um, add that for me, it's a little different because as an Armenian ethnic religious minority in Iran, I already had that minority status experience within the majority Iranian society. And then coming to the United States, the, um, the mentality generally was, and I think this is for probably all Armenians also, that we are going to this majority Christian country. So we will be part of the majority. And then it was not until I arrived in Los Angeles um, and not even during my MA program, but in the PhD that I realized that I am a woman of color. And then I had to, um, you know, figure out what that means and how I position myself as a woman of color inside that larger group of women of color. But I, I do think that I, I mean, if I'm identifying as a woman of color, identity is not something that someone can force upon me. So I, I, I as Nushan John was saying, it is, I feel like very offensive for someone to tell me you are white, you're not woman of color. 
So I, I'm, I will have less tolerance with that kind of conversation if someone tries to tell me about my identity and how I, I identify. But um, yeah, today I do identify as a woman of color and I have had um, experiences of, you know, um, obstacles and all of that. And even though I, I think the trend is that, you know, we are, we are seeing all these um, pieces, news pieces and um, gradually white women who are faking or acquiring the woman of color identity because they want to pr um, have the privilege that comes with being a woman of color or person of color from fellowships or you know positions, hirings, promotions, all those things, um, might that might basically send the message that as a person of color you have all these privileges, and that's why these white women want to be in the in that position. But but that's not the entire truth and the broader picture of things. It. It just talks about the fact that uh, the minuscule that is given to women of color is also being stolen from them by these white women. That's great, thank you. I'm glad you mentioned those instances. Um, let me, before going any further, let me get you on Aitajun to comment on this. And by the way, before I turn to you, we had a lovely comment, not so much a question, a comment, and a thank you for organizing this. And I have to, I myself, I'm grateful to um, uh, to, to have had the opportunity and to have my colleague um, to Rajdari ask me to organize this. So that's wonderful. So, um, Anahita Jun, I'll turn to you. Yeah. John, I'm uh, so First of all, Claudia, John, I'm so thankful that you mentioned your minority status within Iran. It is important for us to realize that we did have a community that even though we uh, did not necessarily have the concepts of race in our community, we did, we were, we are, we were, we are a society of um, having minorities. And for uh, with my experience the speaking with hearing the stories of the minorities in Iran, they were subjects of discrimination. So it is important that we mention that this have existed in Iran for Armenians, Christians, Jewish people, Baha'is, and many others. So I, I'm, I'm so thankful you reminded us of that. But for myself, I really never in the past 35 years being outside of Iran, identified as white. There was just absolutely no option. You, you know, you, you, um, you have the um, title of being a refugee, you are Middle Eastern. And I've, I, I, it was pretty shocking when I actually had to hear Iranian people uh, trying to identify as white. And obviously there's psychological aspects of it when you're an immigrant, your process of acculturation and assimilation, uh, you go through many ups and downs in different ways. One of the ways are, or one of the aspects are uh, trying to be camouflaged within the whole society, thinking you're safer, thinking you're, you're secure. If I'm one of them, I am secure. But the reality is that in the, in, the, in the eyes of the whole society, you are a minority. So I, I, I'm, I'm proud of my identity and I, uh, I identify with who I am, not because I am against any other identities, but that is how I identify. This is my true uh, identity, it's my truth. Um, and in the reality of uh, American society or also, it is pretty inevitable that you are put in that category. Uh, if you wanna talk about history and how Iranians identified with being historically Caucasians and Aryans, I think we can all uh, ask Dr. Dariahi to open a five hours of lecture for us to, you know, again and again prove his factualities that it is wrong. But uh, I even went further and did a DNA 23andMe test to just make sure that, you know, I'm accurate DNA wise and I was, there's no um, white or European. So other than that, I, um, I just think that there are many 
different elements that we all can talk about, you know, in these two polar opposites that, you know, am I a woman of color, am I a, am I a, am I a white woman as Iranians? And nonetheless, uh, I think our experiences are pretty different than a white woman's experience, regardless of what we identify as. Exactly, exactly. I think that's very true. We already have some questions coming in. I was going to just touch up on a few points and ask you to follow up um, the whole issue of race and racialization as we all know, has a very, has, has a long history in Iran, and it's not yet completely unpacked for all of us. I mean, even psychologically, it's not unpacked for all of us. I sometimes find that um, the same kind of reaction that you have run into is that Iranians assume that um, oh, well, we're white, and they say, well, it's in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> so see how others see you before you categorize yourself. Um, let me... Um, may, may I add yes. something, Nasrin? Please, Jones, by all means. To, to what Anaita John mentioned, um, just going back to the ethnic religious minorities in Iran, I want to emphasize that that mentality of, for example, Baha'is, Armenians, you know, the Jewish community from Iran, when they are transplanted here, the same minority star, um, status within the broader majority Iranian community is still prevalent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that oh, is absolutely. also that is also dominant in the um, in the academic circles too. Yeah. Absolutely. Yes, absolutely. Absolutely. If I may just add my own uh, little comment is that the first kindergarten and elementary school I went to in Iran in what was called Bandar Pahlavi. It was an Armenian school. And um, I had no idea, well, this is just tells you something. I had no idea that uh, they were the minority. I felt like we were the minority. But of course, from the perspective of a child, there was also, you know, the concept didn't really exist for me. But it, is, it was years left, later, after I'd left Iran, after I joyfully found some of my um, teachers from the Armenian schools, my friends, um, that I really, came to understand what those differences were that were not palpable to me, apparently not even visible to me. So we don't always have the privilege of being able to say, well, I don't see it, or we, can, we may have the privilege of not seeing it, but we really uh, cannot assume that everybody has, has the same experience as we have. Okay, let me turn to some, we have some good questions here, if I may. Um, so the first one is, can you please talk about your challenges as a research, uh, challenges rather, as a researcher and instructor in the US, particularly those of you working on women and LGBTQ people's issues in Iran? I think that's an important question. Um, Claudia, would you like to take that up because you have worked, uh, or you know, I'm thinking of the, the special issue we co-edited perhaps. Um, yeah, sure. Uh, and I wanted to actually mention that um, you're talking about minority status as, you know, people of color, race, ethnicity, and religion. But we have to also, you know, consider that gender plays a huge role in all of this also. So it's all intertwined. And we all know that racism and sexism in academia are sy systemic. And I mean, they are also, you know, they, they are supported by all sorts of uh, structures of power in, in academia. And women of color, it doesn't matter in what position you are or in, um, in what field you're working, you have to work harder, harder than a white woman, essentially. So in terms of, for the question, for the sake of question, in terms of teaching, you have to work so much harder for your students to take you serious. Mm -hmm. You have to work so much harder for your colleagues to take your research seriously. Mm -hmm. 
you have to work so much harder to prove that your promotion, your hiring, your position is not because of the affirmative, you know, um, what is it, statement? Uh, yeah, uh, action, the, affirmative action policy. Yes, yeah. and, and that you are not, you are not in this position because you bring diversity or because you you are you know part of an agenda that the institution has so and 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 i have to mention that this is very isolating because in academia you will find um i mean depending on where you're teaching and um where your research is, you will find few people like yourself, few women of color with whom you have to create your tribe and support each other. Because um, yeah, you, you, the dominant, I mean, where I am, the dominant, you know, uh, majority is of course white and and then you look at the leadership positions, for example, everybody is white. And then you're looking at women of color. They, you will see a few women of color in positions of you know, leadership, but they are always like assistant dean, associate dean. When can I get to the dean? When can I get to the chancellor? When can I see a woman of color at the top? So, the, yeah. Um, if either of you, we now have a number of questions. If either of you, Nushan or Anahita, would you like to add something before I turn to the next question? Um, if on it's this okay, one? I just, I wanted to say, um, Claudia Jun brought up something interesting about teaching. Uh, one thing that I um, oftentimes have this conversation with my female colleagues, especially women of color, um, and my white male colleagues look at me like, what are you talking about, is oftentimes having your expertise and your um, resume essentially questioned, not just by other colleagues, but by your students. Um, to the point of, you know, you put up a presentation in class or you're uh, doing, you know, a look at statistics, you know, you're doing something very objective. I'm not talking about a heated even argument. And I've had quite a bit, and my other uh, uh, female colleagues could attest to this, uh, male students, white male students, um, question essentially my expertise level or where'd you get that source from or mm -hmm. you know is that that sounds like it's you know something that's twisted or and and oftentimes they don't have anything to back it up with um, and it's not for the purpose of intellectual engagement the narrative is more well I need you to explain to me where this came from but if I speak to one of my male colleagues who teaches political science who's in a theory class who's in an international relations class whatever it is that we both teach he says oh, they've never asked me that question whatever I tell them they just say okay so I feel like I have to defend my expertise, my resume, my scholarship, my research. Um, and that is astounding to me because I think, you know, the way that I grew up and, and when I went to college, even though I did all of my academic career here, I would never question my professor's expertise. Maybe I didn't like a particular professor because he or she was grumpy or <laughs> they gave me too much work or something, but I could never imagine disrespecting that person's education or expertise or, um, questioning really uh, sort of their decency um, in, in teaching and and you find that and it's it's and it's difficult uh, you know to uh, you know stay calm and not take it personally and realize that that doesn't define you but 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 somehow there's been this precedent said that if you're a woman of color even if you're teaching in a presentation at a seminar a webinar in a classroom that people give themselves the right to question your level of expertise the content of your education that's very separate from you know me expressing my opinion so that's been something that's been very challenging and i hate to sound like a broken uh record here but in the last four years it's been more challenging teaching political science. I, you know, I often wish I taught something else. So. You would have some different challenges, but I'm sure. I'm sure. <laughs> exactly. Anna, thank you, Nishanjan. Anna, sure. did you have a point on? Did you want to address this point, or well, should I? Move on? I know that you want to move on to another question. No, but that's okay. Keep it short, because in the question, the LGBTQ was mentioned, and I don't want to dismiss it. Um, so I believe that uh, 
as Iranian American woman, or however we identified Iranian, uh, Armenian, Iranian American, we need to um, be, what we don't need to, I hope that we are in support of our uh, LGBTQ community that is pretty much in hidden. Um, they are everywhere and they are, um, in, in, they are being discriminated against. And I, uh, I do know uh, in our community, a few uh, colleagues or friends of LGBTQ, and I'm hoping that, um, I'm not sure exactly how this was in the question, but I'm hoping that we can show support and we can stand up for them and be uh, there for them when they need uh, support that they need. But um, as far as challenges, there are so many challenges. I personally, uh, every time I walk in, at least, I mean, in, in the previous department I was, I would walk in to department meetings, it's all white uh, faculty, all white deans, chairs. Uh, the fact that, you know, you, yes, you are a uh, Claudia John looked upon as if you have been, a, there's a favor done to you that you have this job because of, uh, you know, many other uh, systems that are in place. And I was actually told in my challenges in the meetings that I had over the tenureship, um, you know, I was actually told we should be thankful for the jobs that we have. So these are, micro, we call them microaggressions. You know, it's not overt and bold telling you what they feel, but it comes as, you know, out as microaggressions and it's, it's hurtful and it is um, uh, pretty much you know, changing the dynamics of how you feel inside going to um, meetings or going to events the way that you are so passionately involved. And then it's as if an alarm clock goes off and constantly, constantly reminds you of, oh, this is who you are. But what is beautiful is our resiliency. What is beautiful is here we are and we've done what we've done despite these challenges. So that gives us a uniqueness of uh, being who we are. Um, so yeah, I will stop here and I allow you to uh, continue. Some of these are not questions, but I would like to take them up as we go because we now have a number. Um, in one, dis one comment is this, in one discussion, um, discussion series on racism where mostly white participants uh, were learning about their attitudes. I've been identifying myself as a Persian from India, being as Akush. These are Astrian born and raised in India. Is that a reasonable to ident a way to identify? I would say yes. Why not? You are you are entitled to that and you um, mark your legacy that way. So absolutely. Um, the next one, so you know, I'm not going to ask all of us to contribute to these if we can for the sake of our ability to be able to go through the questions. I'm awed, here's a comment, I'm awed by the determination and perseverance of these three young women in achieving their current statuses in academia. Is my impression correct that because of your fields having many women academics, you are less impacted by gender discrimination than say women in STEM fields. You would be surprised. <laughs> if I, I may agree. just say this, is that <laughs> yeah, when we talk about microaggressions and put downs, one thing that I felt like, I'm, if you will allow me just to say this briefly, we move on. It, it is not that there are more women and therefore we, I have found that among Iranians, Iranian men don't, acknowledge that they are putting us down when they talk about our work. And I have seen people in positions of status right here in Southern California who have gone out of their way to tell me to put me in my place. So let us not assume that uh, because of our field. But it's, a, it's I understand your question. In STEM fields, they have similar challenges but it's not to say that they are different. I think if you, we could easily expand this panel and uh, include others. Claudia John, you had a comment to make. Yeah, I, I wanted to add that um, gender um, inequality is also, let's not forget that the status quo and these inequalities in terms of gender is also uh, maintained by women. 
Mm -hmm, absolutely. We do have women who maintain the status quo. So mm -hmm. let's not forget about that. I have personally been subject to you know, microaggressions from women of color that you would think they are there to support you in Iranian studies field. So it, I don't think it is um, field specific. I think gender, racism, it's intertwined. Okay, with wow. your permission, I'll proceed then. Hi everyone, many, many thanks for sharing your story uh, with us. It inspired me a lot. I have a question regarding the future of academia and academia in the US. I've always heard that entering the US academia needs a lot of prerequisites and a great number of publications. My question is, what were your hardships to prove your eligibility to take the position? Do you think a better prospect for the future to facilitate women in academia? Um, I, I think that it's true of not just women. I think it is that in academia, depending on the kind of institution you are um, aiming for, yes. I mean, in some universities, you will have to have a lot of publications before you even begin. And uh, by the way, I think it's, it's really not just specific to our field either in that sense. But anybody uh, want to take that up? I don't want to speak for everyone in that regard. Is that okay? We can move on to the mm -hmm. next. Can I mention something? There is also racism in publications. So as a woman of color, again, you have to have more publications and then you compare yourself and your achievements with your white male colleague and you see that they get the pass with nothing. And then if you There's complain a, about it, then and if you and if you complain about it, then you're actually being hypersensitive, and you know you're making such a big deal out of this. So it's constantly a struggle for establishment of who I am. I'm not being hypersensitive. I'm not making something bigger than it is. I, there's really a question about equality, equity, um, recognition, acknowledgement, and all of those things. So, um, I, I understand that. Um, there's a question that is specific to Nushan, so if I may, I'll just turn to that. This is a question for Nushan. How do you respond to students who question your expertise? Uh, I take lots of deep breaths uh, before I lose my mind. <laughs> but um, I often I, I often respond with, um, you know, would you be asking me this if I was not a woman of color? And um, I didn't used to do that. I used to actually answer them. Well, I went to school here and I did this and this is my work and this is what I published. And then I thought, why am I doing this? Because I was so uh, much more interested in making the student feel comfortable and making them feel included. And then I realized I don't need to do that. Um, so I said, well, would you be asking me this if I was, and then, you know, somebody else? No, I just want to know. Um, it doesn't hurt to ask. And so what I usually do is just put them on the spot and say, this is not appropriate. Um, Clearly, if you're here, it's because uh, you've chosen to take a class with an expert. I'm the expert in the field. And if you'd like to discuss it a little bit further about the scholarship, about the content of what I'm discussing, we can talk about it after class. Otherwise, where I went to school and, you know, what I do in my free time and, you know, I'm, I'm, that's not really important. Um, oftentimes, they, they will diffuse it by asking me something personal. So what do you like to do for fun or what do you like to read? Um, and I'm normally very comfortable with those kinds of questions from students, but I think it's a way of compensating for who I stepped over the line, you told me to back off, and so now we're going to be friends. Um, so I respond with essentially asking them if this is an appropriate question to ask um, me because of my gender and my color. Okay. Yes. I'm, I'm going to skip around. I have uh, a question. There are some questions here that are uh, are a little difficult to pinpoint in answers. So if you will allow me, I'll skip through, go to the ones that we can take up and then come back when, if we have time. Mm -hmm. um, there's a question um, from a white male academic who says, I'm embarrassed by the uphill battle you have faced. What can someone like me do to support your great work? Anyone want to take that um up? So I uh, was reading the questions and I saw the question. It's from my dear colleague, Father J. 
Jack Kearney. <laughs> I know <laughs> he's a he's an he's in academia. He's an academic, and he's a Catholic priest. Um, I just want to say that he has been an amazing support for me. Uh, he's been there and has helped me a lot in many projects that we had. But um, so I think he's already there and he's already doing what he's doing. But the question is a good question as far as the you know a general aspect that it has that um, if any white males are listening, how you help is to uh, be courageous to open space. And that goes for all of us, for everyone that is holding on to certain powers. How courageous are you to let go of that power, to open the space for the person of color next to you? I believe that uh, what I uh, what what was done for me by the chair that uh, hired me was an act of courage. Of I am allowing you to come in and be my partner. Um, unfortunately, most of it, most of the times. Uh, we are afraid of bringing people in, thinking they will take our place and thinking, you know, there's always this human aspect, it's very natural of uh, competition and, 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 and this paranoia that what if this person that I'm bringing in is stronger than me and which in fact, if I am, if I am uh, in charge of a project, if I am in charge of a department, I want people that are stronger than me to be in that project. I want people that are absolutely experts to be in my department. And uh, that has always been my approach, a teamwork and being able to open space for those who uh, are struggling to come to this space. And obviously the highest privileged community in this country being the white male, that's what they can do, open the spaces, open the platforms. Uh, but I also wanted to address something that it's my uh, ideology long ago in America, I um, came to this conclusion that if in America, the oppressed communities that have been oppressed and discriminated against for centuries, are not going to get what they deserve, we won't because we have come here after them. We are here, immigrants, because of the civil rights movements in America. We all are being here. We all are the rights that we have as immigrants to the civil rights, to the Black freedom movements and, and those fighters and warriors. So that is why also us as women of color and people of color, that we need to stand by the black community, the indigenous community of America. If these communities are not going to receive the freedom they deserve, if the justice they deserve, um, even though we have the privileges we have because of them, I don't believe that there is justice done. So I have, tr I have tried to be very aware of who am I supporting? Who am I bringing up? Who do I open the doors for? Um, I think that's the key. Thank you. Um, I have a question here that um, is, opens up a, a different way of tackling some of these issues. Um, thank you so much for the conversation. Minority experience is often filled with trauma. How do you manage to meet the high expectations for productivity in the US academia? If I may just quickly say this before I turn to others. Um, there was also a question about, can you look back to your graduate experiences and uh, tell us how you overcame some of those challenges? And I'm trying to bundle some of these questions together. In my case, I remember uh, when I was studying, getting my doctorate in comparative literature at, in the, during the ice ages. Um, you know, when I put some Iranian writers uh, as part of, I proposed that I would study them in my thesis, the question that was asked over and over again was, uh, but are they good enough? Do they measure up to the masterpieces of, you know, European literature and so on? So, and 
And actually, Aisha Johnson, that's your question. I'm, I'm taking that as a way of dealing with it's traumatic because it is such a blow to one's own sense of what your culture is. So never mind being a woman or, you know, it is, it's, it's offensive on so many levels. But that, that's one of the experiences I had uh, during my graduate studies. But there, I would also say that even to this day, there I can sit around the table and have people including our dear beloved compatriots, go on about the achievements of a male scholar sitting next to me. And then, then I become Nasreen June. You know, the, 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 the titles drop and so on. So the, the, it is, the, I've not addressed the question of how do you deal with that challenge. Let me just briefly say that I chose to write about it. And I chose to write about our own communities ways of not seeing and covering over some of this. I'm sorry I took so long. I want the rest of you to, to make your comments. I, I, I'll answer that too. Um, as I mentioned, um, I think this was Aisha's comment, um, mm -hmm. create your tribe. I cannot emphasize this enough. Find people who are supportive when you share your story of trauma with these people, and then you, I mean, for me, it was, for example, Janet and Nasreen. When I shared with Nasreen and she tells me that she has gone through the same things, and then I see where Nasreen is today, that's enough inspiration for me. And that gives me motivation to work harder to show that my resilience and and I know that we are resilient. So find your um, tribe that will support you and never ever forget um, self care. That is the most important thing. If you are not in a good space in terms of your self care, you cannot produce. That's very true. That's very right. Um, let me go to uh, the question about how do you think, uh, what role do men, can men play? And there's an answer to that in saying the person's asking what they can do to help women in their uphill struggle, forming or participating in an advocacy group is one option. And thank you for that reply. I do think it's very true. Mm -hmm. I think it's also being a question of being Having, opening your eyes and seeing things because we all, I myself am guilty of this, that sometimes we forget that those sitting right beside us aren't having the same sense of privilege and are not in the same position of power. So whether you're a man or woman, anytime you see a way in which you can open a door for somebody, um, and I don't mean that literally, <laughs> I mean that you can create a space in which they can become who they really can become, mm -hmm. then um, I think that's an opportunity. And thank you for putting that response mm -hmm. um, there for us. Um, can, here's can, a, can I add validation? Va um, validation is very important. If I come to you and feel that this is a safe space and I'm talking to you about the inequities that I'm observing, do not dismiss it. Mm -hmm. Validation. Just the fact that you're asking this question right now is a validation for me that you are seeing me yeah. I, I'm, or someone like me. We are becoming visible That's in terms exactly. of our struggles. And it's true that there's nothing worse than telling someone who's having this kind of experience, oh, aren't you being a little emotional? Uh, yes. Yeah. When I reported an incident to my one of my deans here at UCI, what I found profoundly offensive from someone who deliberately wanted to humiliate me. And that, by the way, that trauma has taken me six years to deal with. And I'm not ashamed of saying that because these are people who are in our community. They have power and they have privilege. And when I reported that to our dean, he said, well, you know, maybe you just need to relax a little bit. Relaxation isn't gonna get rid of humiliation. So, Absolutely. <laughs> so you know, 
Nasty, yes, I just, by all I'm, means. I'm so sorry. I just wanted to say even something as basic as um, pronouncing our names correctly. Don't abbreviate my name. Don't change it to something different. Um, learn to say our names correctly. Um, I don't expect someone to have a perfect, beautiful Persian accent, but it's, just say it correctly. It's not, it's Nushan, it's not Nina, it's not Nancy, it's not, you know, just say the name correctly. <laughs> um, I think that's important because, uh, you know, it, it's just, it, you know, it just, it takes an extra 30 seconds, just say my name correctly. That ties into the validation, that ties into the recognition. Um, and really the celebration of the culture. Um, I, I try my best when I'm going down the attendance sheet for my students, when we used to be face to face in the good old days, to specifically learn the students' names, uh, pronounce it correctly. Um, you know, I, I mean, you do that to, 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 for them to be seen and for them to be heard and for them to be respected. And sometimes you have a tough time getting that from your colleagues in meetings or the first time you meet someone. So just say our names correctly. I mean, that's, that shouldn't be too much to ask. Mm -hmm. You know, yes, absolutely. <laughs> and, and Nassim, Nassim, if I may, the aspect absolutely. of the emotional woman that you mentioned and we hear a lot, you know, be less emotional. Uh, I had this conversation once at the meeting, right in the meeting, that there's absolutely nothing wrong with being emotional, mm -hmm. emotional human beings. So well, how you react under the emotion, obviously, it's really important. You need to have that emotional regulation. But, you know, we know how uh, African-American women have been discriminated by many labels, such as the angry black woman. But you, we each, each of us have such different life experiences. So for black women, for uh, women uh, of color like us, Middle Eastern women, with backgrounds of constant discrimination, all these ups and downs, the traumas, you build some internal emotions. And culture adds to it because culturally we ex are expressive in, with our emotions. And when it comes across as people looking at you and calling you an emotional woman, I have always corrected them on the spot. That's a part of teaching, making people aware. Yes, of course, in professional settings, nobody should yell and scream. When white men do, when white women do, it's them being so passionate. But when women of color do or people of color do, it's labeled by angry and emotional. Nothing wrong with being emotional. It's great to have emotional regulation. But one of the things I have started, I. I actually took upon myself to do as awareness and, and uh, education is talking about these things very frank. Uh, it's very uncomfortable, it makes people uncomfortable, but that's how we learn. Um, so there's nothing wrong with being a little bit of emotional human beings that we are. Well, co isn't calling women emotional sexist? It is. It it's sexist. Is. Yeah, it mm -hmm. is. Sexist, yeah. absolutely. These are ways in which labels can be demeaning and the person may not realize that there's a history behind them all. Mm -hmm. There is a question that is um, slightly different and uh, I wanted to take that up. Have you encountered any obstacles during job interviews that were related to your origin and or gender? If so, how did you respond to them? I, I can't really talk about my own experience, but I, the fact that we, even to this day, we have to train people, academics, about hiring committees, what That's they true. may or may not say um, is uh, telling that, uh, of course, you know, I was, when I was an associate dean uh, at a university in Canada, I was astounded at the number of times when there were female candidates that people without any sense of boundary would say, oh, are you married? Do you have any children? Do you plan to have children? I mean, no. these are totally inappropriate yeah. um, kinds of questions. So there are many ways in which these uh, questions can come across as hostile, by the way. And um, for me, the experience in an interview was when as I was presenting, 
one male colleague, who was, becomes has become a colleague anyway here, uh, was just sort of like, oh, doing, I'm tired, I'm exhausted, I'm bored. You know, mm -hmm. we all have affect and I'm very conscious of that. I realize I roll my eyes, I do all of these things, but when you're communicating even through body language that mm -hmm. you're done with this person. And I think in such instances, I almost respect the person more if they get up and leave <laughs> because they shouldn't feel obliged to stay if that's the case. But uh, if I can answer it in a long-winded way to come back to it, and I say that it's best, especially in an interview, when some people will tell you, oh, be careful because you don't want to step on any toes and so on. But they have to know who you are. So mm -hmm. you have to find a way to tackle the question, particularly if it's meant as a put down. But anything you, any of you would like to add to that? Mm -hmm. we, we can the institution, um, not at in the institution that I am now, uh, but I applied for a different institution before this institution. And there was a woman of Middle Eastern descent on the hiring committee. I didn't get the job there. And I'm not saying she had anything to do with it. I don't want to start gossip, but uh, she, I noticed that she wouldn't make eye contact with me. And it was like, she could see, you know, she was looking through me. She wouldn't make eye contact. Um, after the interview was over, um, I, I, I think I said goodbye to her in Farsi. Uh -huh. She responded back to me in English and was not happy with that. And then she sent me an email later and she said that what I did was very unprofessional. And if I think I spoke Farsi with her, that was going to help me get the job. I'm not going to. And I thought, okay. Um, but, and I, and it, it doesn't even matter. I got the job at where I am and I'm much happier here. But I thought to myself, wow, you're one of us. You're supposed to be what happened to sisterhood? What happened to a sense of, I mean, I didn't think because I said Khodafes instead of goodbye that I was going to get the job. But because she was Iranian, I was particularly offended. And this is, you know, over 20 years ago. But I, to this day, I don't ever forget that story of how offended she was that I said to her, I spoke in our, you know, native tongue to her. So that was very disappointing. But um, maybe she was having a bad day. I don't know. <laughs> those bad days <laughs> yeah and actually the the equivalent of uh what you were just saying it wasn't a, a job interview but meetings with particular individuals from our own community men who insisted on speaking english with me Mm. when both of us are you know not native speakers of english for the love of god i felt like saying <laughs> can't we just speak farsi and get it over with but those are all ways in which you signal how you view your interlocutor and whether you're allowing them to and in fact sometimes as i've written about it is that i think those behaviors betray more about our insecurities than any position of certainty about our identity. So I've become a little fascinated with those little games people play. But anyway, that's an aside. <laughs> there was a question that I think it's good for us to think about. Um, oh dear, let me see. Uh, there was a question about if you could, oh, so you, uh, all right, so you have all overcome the identity situation and are achieving all your goals. Would you go back to Iran work for the same goals of women's equality and empowerment, freedom and practicing one's faith and, univer and universal human rights and equality for all Iranians under the rule of law? Uh, if I may just be really cavalier and I don't mean it to come across that way, I'd love to do that work in Iran, but uh until there's a little bit more space and the kind of environment that didn't drive us all away um yes. I, I there's not a moment there's not a day in my career that i do not think of all the hardships that my compatriots are facing men women of different um ethnicities religions beliefs orientations and i regret that i cannot do this work in Iran and unfortunately the reality is what it is um, you know I used to think that I was achieving a lot more but lately I, I, in this environment we had all sorts of possibilities but that myth is becoming a little bit more challenged here too mm -hmm. so um, yeah 
Yeah, I, I think I'm taking uh, up too many ideas. No, no, it's wonderful to hear from you, Nassington. I think the question was addressing the universality of work, the work that we're doing. So when we uh, put it in that uh, category, our work is universal. What we do, um, you know, for myself at least, um, I believe that what we do in the little corners of our lives is changing the world in that little corner and corner by corner, we are applying that change uh, in a universal way. And as you said, uh, Nassim Jun, uh, and I call you Nassim Jun because you told me to, because I- Absolutely, I, 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 I want to do yeah, yeah. Um, uh, And I, uh, as, as you said, we are here not voluntarily. I am not here voluntarily, I left Iran um, you know, not voluntarily. Um, do I want to go back to Iran? Do I want to do this work, Iran? I think, as you said, Nassim Jun, there's not a day that I don't think about uh, the sufferings that our uh, Iranian people are going through. Um, as I think about the sufferings that Armenian people are going through right now, as I think about the sufferings of the whole population in Yemen, for example. So, it is universal. Work for justice and advocacy is universal. And if um, one day the opportunity comes to go back and do this work, by all means, I just don't see it in any near future that it would happen. But if it does happen, uh, never say never. Uh, yes, I would be. I would love to do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, for me, as I get older, too, um, and the longer I stay here, the the more there is this longing for, for your homeland, for the, what we say in Farsi, Vatan, you, you have it. There, there are times where you think, I think when you're younger and you want to acculturate and assimilate and you, know, you want to speak English and you want to look like everybody else in the classroom, you know, as you're in your you know, younger years and your teenagers. But for me, the older I became, especially when I went to college and I had a lot of Iranian friends, uh, a lot of them still very dear to me and in my life, I, this longing continued. And now in my late forties, I continuously have these fantasies of what it would be like to even live in Iran or even to teach in Iran or to be there. But I know it's not safe for women. I know it's not possible in many ways. I speak to my cousins who are professionals and working there in Iran and they say there is no space for you here. It's not safe for you here. You know, um, we don't even know if it would be safe for you to come for a visit these days. So there, there's, there's a lot of a sadness and I think mourning and grief that we all carry that all of these accomplishments that we have, we can't have it in our country, even though as Anahita said, what we do is universal and it matters. But I often wonder if I had stayed in Iran, what my life would have been like, you know, or, or for my sister, would she still be a therapist? Would I still be a political scientist? Um, so there's this longing that I think doesn't go away. And I think that's beautiful. Uh, it's a deep love for Iran and for for the struggles that women have there. You think of Nasrin and, and, and countless others. Um, but for us, it's not possible at the moment, unfortunately. Yeah. Right. Thank you. And um, for me, yes, Claudia. Uh, for me, I mean, I, I as I mentioned, my career started in Iran. I was a tenured professor in Iran, and I left. And um, my colleagues, my friends here, already explained why. So I won't go over that. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, Claudia John, there's an, a question addressed to you, and I don't want to lose sight of that. Thanks for acknowledging the fact that some Iranian women in academia in the West play an important role in marginalizing and silencing other academic women, particularly those who enter humanities fields from different religious, political, and social backgrounds. We have witnessed several cases in North America of uh, some Iranian scholars, men and women, try to silence the indigenous and authentic movements in Iran and going against those who try to give a voice to those marginalized movements and individuals suppressed by Iranian authorities, as well as global apartheid that intends to silence Iranian democratic struggles in general, Iranian movements in particular. Um, that was more of a comment, I thought there was a question I kept reading. Yeah, it is important, by the way, and sometimes when we think about Iran, and in my own um, case, in my imaginary, in my cultural imaginary, Iran is this entity as if I can get a hold of it and hold it tight, and it is this unique thing that is transferable. But of course, 
Iran is a very complex, diverse, and complicated place. And it's so easy for us to lose sight of those uh, things. I recently, in fact, went back to studying poetry in Gilaki because for years it wasn't, you couldn't even publish it, right? Under the Shah, under this wonderful uh, modernizing, secularizing movement. So there are many, many ways in which we can help each other and also of course impede one another. So thank you for that comment. And there was a question. I'm, I, can I just answer this question quickly and I'll come back. It, somebody asked if this was being recorded indeed and it will be shared. So no worries about sharing it. I'm so sorry I interrupted. It's okay. Um, I, I just wanted to um, add the example of the Me Too movement in Iran and the name of Aydin Ardashlu mm -hmm. and the fact that so many women came out backing him up against the, the women who have been harassed. Yes. So, I mean, we see all these structures of power, you know, oppressing different women in different ways within Iranian community itself and within the, um, you know, the larger community or society in North America. So, yeah. That's very unfortunate. It's a reality, though. It's a very complex reality to comprehend. Uh, but I feel like it's also the same uh, concepts of uh, this white feminism that has penetrated amongst the uh, women of color, feminism for women of color. I can, I've never identified with that feminism. And unfortunately within Iranian community, many Iranian American women that have um, established Iranian groups, you can see that uh, the touch of that white feminism that is very disappointing. Uh, but hearing these stories, uh, it's always um, mind boggling. You know, how do you take side with oppressor? Um, it's still till until this day it's psychologically sociologically you historically you mentioned uh, taking the, the oppressed taking side with oppressor is a subject that i think we can talk about for days and still not come to a um, to a result that's correct true there's uh, this will be the last question i will raise because we're coming to the end of our time um, and I want to just leave a few minutes for closing remarks. There's a question, uh, why not use uh, anger as a revolutionary act, act against injustices as Bell Hooks famously uses it in her article, Uses of Anger. Mm. That's an excellent question. And I bet we all have different positions on this. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I yeah, yeah, go ahead, Anna, I did you. No, 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 please go. I, I thought you were... Uh, oh, no, I was just going to say that um, I, um, anger, I think, is a useful tool. And I myself have, without even really necessarily plotting it out, gone there. Um, because of the, what I consider to be kind of structural sexism in the institutions, unfortunately, we get labeled as hysterical women. And I, I, this is not in any way to diminish Bell Hook's very legitimate point, and I'm actually I agree with it. But I think that I would say that for me, it's a question of deploying whatever tools we want to deploy strategically. Now, that's just my position. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm so actually grateful that the name Bell Hooks was mentioned as she's a giant figure. Um, and I actually have also always categorized myself more in that category of uh, more Malcolm X and Bell Hooks. And, you know, it's always for me to remind myself and, you know, just, uh, but I think they, 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 they um, phrase use your anger is very different than be angry. So right. use your anger, channeling your anger to never forget your struggles and the struggles of others. 
So channel that anger and change it to penmanship like bell hooks or change it to being a professor that uses and cultivates so social justice in his or her practices. Use your anger to be that person that is in the streets and protesting. Use, so using our anger uh, gives, it, it's actually fueled by that identity that we talk about, by the experiences that we bring uh, uh, with ourselves. Um, so for me, the meaning is, it, it kind of defines as using my anger, the anger that is, has witnessed so much trauma, not just to me, not just to Iranians, but to Americans, to African Americans, to Asians, to indigenous people, to Middle Easterns, to that anger that comes from human suffering and channel it to cultivate practices that are for the well being of my students, of my colleagues, of my friends, of my family. So that's how I uh, understand it. Any, uh, Nushan Jan, would you like to say something? Sure. Uh, turning, I couldn't say uh, you both said it perfectly, but I, I was thinking to myself turning the anger into service, into kindness, into uh, the element of paying it forward. If we felt like at some point in our career, at some point in our immigration and publishing that paper and writing that book, we had even an ounce of privilege, uh, you know, plant that seed into somebody else's career and mentor and be kind and really use it to our advantage, Th then anger doesn't seem so frightening. And it's not about being hysterical and out of control, but it's about having some sort of direction and purpose. Um, I think that's the narrative of anger, really, if you can turn that that negative experience into something positive. And I've, I've been blessed that someone has helped me and then I try to you know pay that forward and help other people who are coming along. I think that's the best way to do it. Wonderful. Wonderful answer. Well, I, clearly we could take much longer and I want to acknowledge a few things. First of all, our panelists, I'm grateful to the three of you and it is the power of this kind of dynamic open discussion that I think has also generated all these questions and comments and they're all wonderful questions and comments. And I apologize that we didn't have time for me to go through all of them. Nonetheless, all the panelists see them and um, Hopefully we can engage in further discussions in future panels. I would, in addition to thanking my three brilliant colleagues here, um, I want to thank Saeed Jalalipur, who has done so much work to make this happen. Um, he's behind the scenes, we don't see him, but I applaud you, Saeed, especially in these difficult times when we have to rely so much on technology and intervention of those who understand it better than some of us old fogies. So I'm grateful to you. Once again, my gratitude to the Persian Center, to all the participants, and thank you for telling us. There are comments here that I'm not reading for the sake of time. People who have expressed their appreciation for such a discussion. I am so heartened by the responses we have received. I think that um, if I, when I tell Turaj about how well this was received, he may have other ideas for how he wants to develop it into a series. Well, thank you. Um, let me start this way. Anahita, Claudia, and Nushan. I have deliberately used personal names without titles because I wanted us to feel a sense of um, closeness and the kind of discussion that we were able to generate. Grateful to all of you. Have thank a great you. rest of your afternoon. And thank you to the Persian Center as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.